Wow. Thank you so much for coming. I can't believe how many people are here tonight. I thought, well, I didn't know. I figured maybe five people would show up. So I can't tell you how touched and pleased I am to see that the people of La Mirinda care enough about their community and what's coming down to come out on a weeknight to a town hall to listen to what I have to say. So I, I can't tell you how, how pleased I am because what I have to tell you is so important to the future of our children, the future of your communities, and it's, it's something that none of us are aware of and we're not meant to be aware of. I'm a realtor. I, I advocate for private property rights. Um, I became aware of the United Nations agenda for the 21st century. That is Agenda 21. Um, and that is, part of that is sustainable development. It's a term that we use every day. We hear sustainable development used on a regular basis in the past, I don't know, 10 years. Suddenly this phrase came into our lexicon, but nobody really knows what it means. We think we know what it means. I mean, we've got sustainable yogurt now, <laughs> right? Because it's just a nice sounding word. But when you actually start looking at the legislation, which you act, when you actually start scratching the surface and looking at what, what is really behind it, what do these words really mean to you and your community, you will find it's not good at all. It's not good for you. It's not good for your kids. It's not good for your private property rights. So we, we want to be sustainable. We want to have clean air. We want to have clean energy. We want to have um, freedoms and liberties. But these things are being taken away, and I'm going to explain to you how this all fits in to one Bay Area plan that's being implemented locally, because the history comes from a globalization that is being handed down. Okay, so let's start. This is a bipartisan effort, okay? This is not about left or right, it's about right and wrong. At both levels, at the very top, there is a plan in place, a global agenda that's being followed. In 1992, there was a Rio Earth Summit, and in that Rio Earth Summit, George Herbert Walker Bush Sr. pledged that we would sign on to Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century, which is a global action plan to be taken locally. By executive order in 1993, Clinton then implemented the President's Council on Sustainable Development. The job of the Sustainable Council was to inject this into every level of our government and, and our communities. And that's why we see it today. That's why there's communities, that's why there's sustainable everything. It's at every level of our government. Now some people say, you know, it was an unbinding treaty, it doesn't really mean anything. And I say, you know, you're right, it was unbinding, but we're implementing it through executive orders, regulations, EPA, um, you name it, okay, zoning ordinances, it's being injected at every level. Sustainable development, what they want you to believe, the definition is, is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, and that sounds good. There's nothing wrong with that. Except when you start looking at the legislation behind it, the actual implementation, it has nothing to do with that. Now this was in 1997, or 1987 from the UN World Commission on Environment and Development, Our Common Future. That's where sustainable development came from. In 1992, it was then adopted in, through Agenda 21 at the Rio Earth Summit. And again, executive order uh, through Clinton's administration um, solidified it. The environment is being used as a tool to push this agenda. Whether it's EPA regulations, whether it's open space, whether it's um, um, water, whatever, we're being scared, these scare tactics are being used so that we will give up our civil liberties, our private property rights, our individual rights for the greater common good. That's what's happening. And in searching for a new enemy to unite us, David Rockefeller says that we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill and then the real enemy is humanity itself. And you can't argue with that. But this is what's happening. Go on. And you'll find that none of this has to do with saving the planet. The plans that they have in place have nothing to do with saving the planet and our resources. It has everything to do with control and money. 
Now, at the top level, the United Nations and the countries that belong to the United Nations, they all know about this. They all know about Agenda 21 and the, and the uh, non-governmental organizations that are pushing this plan. We had a delegate go to Rio. The, the Rio Plus 20 Summit was in June. And we had a delegation go to find out for themselves what was really going on. And they were interviewing people from Africa and all over the world and saying, have you heard of Agenda 21? Have you heard of this NGO called ICLE, the International Council for Local and Environmental Initiatives, that is injecting itself into our local land policies and environmental policies here in the United States? And they said, of course, we know all about Agenda 21 and the United Nations Agenda 21 and ICLE. They've been in our countries working for sustainable development for over 20 years. You've got to be kidding, right? So they looked at us like we were lying because they know all about it. The plan is to redistribute the wealth globally of the American people to these other countries. We are one vote in the United Nations. All of these other countries are voting to redistribute the wealth of the American people. So they're all on board with this. They all know about it. They couldn't believe that the American people who are speaking about this and alerting others are being laughed at and told that we're, we're somehow conspiracy theorists when you can Google all of this information and see for yourself. It's common knowledge to, to the rest of the world, and they're on board with it. Why? Because they're all going to benefit from this. So these plans are being laid in place. They're setting international policy through these non-governmental organizations. The APA, the American Planning Association, gets its directives from these international policies through ICLE. Climate use, la land use, or climate change, land use policies, all of these are being injected into our local governments. Also, we have unelected regional bodies and boards that are now getting their directives as well. And that's where ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, which is the regional cog, the Council of Governments, that um, we were talking about earlier, is making a regional plan for nine Bay Area counties. A one-size-fits-all, cookie-cutter solution to transform your communities into high-density, stack-and-pack housing next to mass transit. Low, low income. And this is all being done by an unelected body. I mean, sure, the people that are on these boards and committees are elected individuals, but you didn't vote for them to do this. There's no such thing as regional government. Our decisions at our cities and counties should be done locally. You should be the ones to decide how your community grows. You should be the ones to decide what happens in your own communities. Local control is the best. You want to be able to hold the people accountable? You need local control. If a regional unelected board is making these decisions for you, you have no control. And that's what's happening. So we are having our whole system of government changed. ICLE is passing that, those land use and climate change policies to these regional unelected boards, also directly into the cities and counties through the climate action plans. And then there's all kinds of NGOs, stakeholders, social and environmental justice advocates and groups that are now popping up all over that are also informing your local cities and counties. And they are getting legislation passed and also um, you know, controlling what's happening. So federal, state, and local is what we should have. That's our system of government. And what's happening in reality is we are getting a shadow government. We have a parallel system of government that's being set up that is subverting the system that we have. If you're wondering why things aren't working properly, it's because we've got all of these NGOs, stakeholders, um, groups, that, and councils that are, that are controlling what's happening, and we, we aren't voting for them, and they're taking over. So at the state level, we've got super councils, unelected boards. One of those boards is um, CARB, the California Air Resource Board, right? The carbon, carbon, credit, trading, carbon, tra carbon credit trading scheme is going to be live in November. Did you know that we can't even audit that board? Our legislator, it was a legislatively created board, but they can't even audit it. And they've also incorporated in, in Delaware so that they don't have to follow an Open Meetings Act. This is the type of stuff that's happening right now. They're making decisions on our behalf, and they are not accountable to the taxpayers. So super councils, unelected boards, and then in addition, those councils are then controlling the regional 
agencies. So we've got um, regional bodies like MTC and ABAG that are making decisions about all nine Bay Area counties. And again, this isn't just happening here, this is happening all over the country. But this is the starting point. We were the first, um, the Bay Area was the first to have a regional COG. I believe it was in the 1960s when they first had ABAG. And back then, they were kind of a benign group. You know, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, and it, it's voluntary, by the way. We can remove ourselves and stop paying dues if your city wants to get out of it. Corte Madera removed themselves. There, there are ways to stop this. But now they're getting funded from the federal government and other sources, and they're very powerful, and they're now taking over for the local cities and counties and making decisions. So the poor cities and, cities and counties are losing control. This is an example of the Sustainable Development Planning Guide that the ICLE group, the International Council for Local and Environmental Initiatives, also known as Local Governments for Sustainability, um, is putting out. This is a land, a, a planning guide. It talks about all the policies that should be implemented at the local level. This is an international organization that's created a world congress. And in order for a city to belong to ICLE, they have to pledge their allegiance to the Constitution with the 16 principles and the Earth Charter to belong to ICLE. And this becomes their agent on a world stage to the United Nations and other governments. I have a copy of the, cal of the Charter and Constitution for ICLE right here. So when our cities and counties tell us we have to do a climate action plan and we're just getting software from ICLE, it's a very dangerous organization and we're not being told the truth. So we need to get rid of this organization. We don't need an international body telling us how to plan our cities and how to live. Now, like I said, we have our federal, state, and local governments being subverted. We have a shadow government that's being formed and it's unaccountable. And there's a very dangerous proposition that is on the ballot I wanted to alert you of, and that is Proposition 31. If you read the proposition, just the title and summary, it sounds like a very benign, ho-hum, nothing to see here proposition. In fact, it sounds pretty good. If you look at the title, it says Government Performance and Accountability Act. So who wouldn't want that? But they always write these initiatives so that you're confu they're confusing and misleading. But when you read the actual text of the entire text, you will see that it, it will amend the California Constitution, institutionalize Agenda 21 Sustainable Development in California, and it will um, create a super council that will oversee everything and be able to stop projects or fund projects based on um, the performance and accountability measures, which will be the three E's of Agenda 21. And those three E's are economy, equity, and environment. So let's look at the three E's, okay? Because when you see the three interlocking circles, and some of you may have seen this on a city council website, a county site, um, some other NGO site, you are looking at the Sustainable Development United Nations three E's, okay? This is their logo. Now, who wouldn't want a good economy? But that's not what economy means. Economy, equity, and environment mean something different. The words and the meanings change, are, are changed. It's not what you think. When they talk about an equitable economy, they're talking about public-private partnerships. They're talking about big government, big corporations, and big labor. That's it. They're not talking about private businesses. They're not talking about private labor. Everything, have you noticed, is going to public-private partnerships. So they're looking at public projects, and those public projects will then be given to benefit corporations, corporations that agree to do what the government wants done, which is going to be sustainable development, sustainable strategies, whatever they decide that that's going to be. Those benefit corporations will then have to use project labor agreements, so they'll, they'll be locked into labor. So those three things are going to feed itself. That's what they mean by economy. When they talk about environment, of course, environment would be anything, have, anything that they want to use in order to regulate you and your property use uh, out of your car, whatever it is they want to do um, in terms of the environment. The first organizing principle will be the environment. And it's not about the environment. We've been, I've been going to these meetings for two years now where ABAG, 
with their One Bay Area plan has been telling us that because we want to save the planet, in order to save the planet, we, all, we need to all get out of our private property. Single family homes are bad. They're unsustainable. We need to move out of our single family homes. We need to all live in stack and pack housing next to mass transit and get out of our cars. And then we go through that process, get to the EIR, which is the environmental impact process, and then they decide, they, they tell us they're going to give all of these developers CEQA waivers, California, um, California Environment Quality Act waivers. In other words, they don't have to do any of the GHG analysis, the greenhouse gas analysis for trucks and, and, uh, and, and cars. So they're all going to get waivers for this. So it's either it's about the environment or it's not. And it's not. They want to, uh, they want to make the development the way they want it. So whatever it is that they de deem to be sustainable development, that's where the money is going to go and that's what they're going to do. Social equity. Social equity, when you see equity, it's all about social justice, environmental justice. It's all about the redistribution of wealth. You are all part of a donor community. Okay? Arinda, Lafayette, and Moraga are donor communities. Okay? You are now going to be injected with recipient class communities. Okay, so part of this redistribution of wealth is going to be that you don't have the diversity. So you're going to have housing, low income, Section 8 housing, low income, very low income, maybe moderate income, but it's going to be mandatory in your cities and towns. So Moraga is slated to have that, Lafayette, Orinda, and this is something that unless your cities and counties agree to it, they won't get their transportation funding. And they're not telling you, and you're not getting to vote on this stuff. This is all being handed down from above. Some of the bills that have been passed that lock us into this path in California, this is already, some of these, well, these have all been done. And this is what puts it all together. SB 375 was passed in 2008. And this is all under Schwarzenegger's watch. So this is not a left or right issue. This is happening on both sides. The fact that we have a democratically controlled um, state house uh, at this point just simply means that you know, nothing can be pretty much done at the state level to stop this train. So the, the fight is at the local level. You need to contact and, and uh, stop this at your city council level. But SB 375 calls for sustainable community strategies, human settlements. It links land use to transportation, and that's where um, the high-density uh, housing next to mass transit is called for. And supposedly, that is necessary to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. So AB 32 is the Global Warming Act, which was passed in 2006 under Schwarzenegger's watch. And so that is supposed to allow us to um, reduce our greenhouse gases and save the planet. Okay, this is all linked together. And part of that is cap and trade, okay, the carbon credit trading scheme. AB 2785 is our open space and wildlands. Everything that's not inside the urban growth boundary, part of the high density housing plan, is going to be slated for open space or highly restricted use. So if you have property outside of the urban growth boundaries, you're going to have a di very difficult time getting permits and uh, use uh, of your property. Okay, so SB 375, this is our sustainable community strategy. This is sustainable development. Okay, so we talked about what sustainable development, they say what it means. It's to maintain it for the future generations. But what it actually means when you read the bill is it, it calls for high density human settlements next to mass transit. This is low income, Section 8, very low income housing, um, but subsidized. You're going to be paying for this. I'm a realtor, I sell these, B they call them BMRs now because they don't like the term low income or Section 8. And I use those terms because that's what they are. And they can call them whatever they want, but they, they're below market rate units now, BMRs. And when you sell a BMR, usually what happens is that that person who buys that property cannot, the, the price of the property is set below the market rate. So whatever the market rate, it's an artificially low value. And those people buy into those properties with 5% down. Typically, the community then will subsidize 15% so that they have a 20% down so they don't have to pay their mortgage insurance. So that's a subsidy from the taxpayers in that city. Those people generally cannot sell, they cannot rent or sublet those properties for 55 years. 
Now they can sell them to somebody else who is a BMR eligible person, but that, that price that they sell it at is set by the city. So I'm talking about, for instance, like in Dublin, you see the whole, you know, what they've done to Dublin, which is just horrible, I think. Um, but we're not helping anybody. We're not helping these people give a hand up because they buy into these properties. They don't get the equity out of it. They don't get to later sell this property at whatever the market value is. They get to sell it at whatever the below market rate is that's set by the city or whoever sets those rates. So they're never really getting a handout. They simply are renters for all of those years. Now the other thing that you need to keep in mind is the injection of the additional um, housing units in your towns and cities um, have other impacts. What about the schools? What about the children that need to go to school? What about the fire? What about the safety? There's nothing in any of these plans that talks about the impact on the schools, what it's going to do. Are we going to build new schools? Who's going to pay for these children to go to school? Who's going to pay for the safety and the fire and all of this stuff? You are. So, you know, when you talk about adding a whole new uh, group, uh, uh, just subsidized housing in every, in every community that wants their transportation funds has to accept this plan. Now, the Association of Bay Area Government says, well, it's just a plan, don't get excited. You know, we can't make anybody do anything. No, we just won't give them any money. So, you know, and, and I've seen, I was at these meetings, I've been at these meetings for two years. What's her name, Karen Mendonca? From Moraga? Okay, well, Karen Mendonca from Moraga, one of the city council people, got up in front of, at one of these hearings and said, well, it's not really for my community to have high density housing, no kidding, since there's absolutely no transit area close by. Um, but because we want the money, we'll agree to do it. I almost fell out of my chair. So these people are selling you out because they want this money. So we need to get them to out of the Association of Bay Area Governments. We need to reject this plan. It's going to be uh, adopted by 2013 unless you people do something. Amy Worth, from, who's from Orinda? Okay, Amy Worth needs to hear from all you people. She is the vice chair of MTC, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and she's all on board with this. And the people of Orinda on both sides of the freeway are going to have high density stack and pack housing subsidized housing in your downtown areas. This is the plan. Now, all of this is being done with CEQA waivers. So I don't care what they tell you about the environment, it's not true. Because unless they plan on taking these people's cars away from them, okay, you are simply di condensing a whole bunch of people into a smaller area, which increases the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, more traffic in your communities, and how are you, well, how are you gonna force these people to use mass transit? Less than 3% of the population currently uses mass transit. The rest of us, the 97% of us that subsidize it, are now gonna have to pick up the tab for even more. This is all about behavior modification. This is all about transformational change. This is all about Re the social re-engineering of our lives. This is a 35-year plan, people, that once they put it in place, and be, this is, yes, it's just a plan and nobody has to do it, but unless they adopt, once this plan is in place, if the local jurisdictions don't adopt it, they won't get any money. And guess what? If somebody does have a backbone and stands up to it, then they probably ha will have the social justice and environmental justice crowd at their meetings calling them racists. I'm just, you know, telling you like it is. So, you know, you got to figure out, I mean, I don't know how to fix this problem. But, you know, I'm incensed about the whole thing. I think it's wrong what's happening. And, and I'm here because I carry that. I, I'm, I've been fighting these people for two years. And I've been trying to inform the public because I think that if you knew the truth about what's going to happen and what they're planning, that you wouldn't want that in your community. But nobody asked you. So maybe if by organizing, by getting the La Mirinda group together, you guys can fight for your own communities. And maybe we can show people like MTC and ABAG and Amy Worth that it's not going to happen in our communities, that we want local control. We don't want a regional unelected body telling us what to do and how to live and, and doing all of this. 
So for $277 billion, that's how much. When I started this two years ago, I think the price tag was $230 billion. Okay, and every time I go to one of their meetings, the price goes up another 10 or $20 billion. But who's counting? $277 billion in federal grant money is being dangled, it's being handed to ABAG, the regional government. It's not, I shouldn't even say government, because it's not. But they want to be a government, and they're getting their, their way because they're getting so much money. So the directive is coming from above through SB 375, sustainable community. So you will build high density housing, et cetera. And how are you going to do that with this money? State redevelopment. We were told last year that the local redevelopment was abolished. Okay, and they, what they did was they took the money and they handed it to the state level. So now state level redevelopment is also being handed down. So everything is happening from the top. Control and money. Now, we were told by ABAG and MTC, oh, we don't know anything about Agenda 21. We don't know anything about um, the United Nations and any of this stuff. This is all coming from the state level. If you don't like what's happening, go vote out Mark Desaunier and all these other people who are pushing for this stuff. It's their fault. So I did, did a little research, and I got on ABAG's website, and I found that in 1997, they signed a compact for a sustainable Bay Area in 1997, before all of this legislation happened. And in that compact, and you can't really see this, but it said that they founded the, it on the principles of the three E's of sustainability. And the Bay Area Alliance adopted that definition of sustainable development that was endorsed by the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development. And Richard Clark, the chairman and CEO of PG&E, Michelle Peralt from the Sierra Club were both uh, members of the President's Council on Sustainable Development. So, you know, who's, to, who, I mean, wh what are we supposed to believe? So these people knew about this in 1997. They signed a secret compact at the ABAG regional level. They pushed for the legislation to be um, put in as a bill, okay, through, I, it was Steinberg that pushed through the uh, SB 375. But they already knew about this. So when they tell us, that they like to point fingers. It's, it's happening at the state level, go after them. And then the state says, well, it's not us. And everybody wants to point fingers. These people knew, and they were in on it. Remember I said in 1993, the President's Council on Sustainable Development was created. So this is how it happens, through the back doors. Here's, what's gonna, here's what your community has to look forward to. Now, these are not my maps. This is off of the ABAG website. These are the existing PDAs right now. These are priority development areas in your communities, and I've highlighted them. These are the areas that are slated for high-density housing. These are, the, these are the areas that will be, will be rezoned to mixed multi-use. Whatever it is now, over the next 35 years, it will, be not, it will not be zoned what it is now. It will be mixed multi-use, and there will be, these will be the priority development areas for those um, sustainable communities. So they, when we subsidize housing and we get these housing allocations for low-income housing in your neighborhoods, in your city, this is where it's slated to happen. Now, what happens to the property values outside of that or the property use outside? It's going to be very difficult for anybody to get things done because most of the building will be done in these areas. Now, some of the things that they do, they shrink the urban growth boundary. Okay, a lot of us have been concerned about sprawl, right? We don't want sprawl. Well, what we've done is simply they've trained us into thinking that horizontal sprawl is bad. Somehow that that's bad to want a single family residential home where you can have a yard and your children playing out in front where you can see them and they're safe. That's bad. That's unsustainable. What they want is everybody to live in vertical sprawl that is subsidized housing paid by the taxpayers. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're basically forcing all of the development by creating that strict urban growth boundary into a compact area, which is what they want. So these are the PDA areas, and this is what you have to look forward to, the rezoning. Now, these are the RENA house numbers, the regional housing uh, needs allocation numbers. This is from 2014 to 2022. So in Lafayette, you will be expecting 426 new 
housing un subsidized housing units. In Moraga, you will be expected to provide 228 new housing units. In Arinda, 226. Now, the, uh, from 20, um, 2007 to 2014, I don't have those numbers. You can look on your own city's website and find out what the housing allocation numbers are. I happened to look up Lafayette today, and I think it was 316. So over the next 14 years, there's going to be 700 and what? Um, what did I say? 87, something like that, um, units in Lafayette. Where are they going to go? I mean, they're talking right now in Lafayette, they've got a height limit. And they're talking about raising that height limit from 35 to 45 feet. This is why. Now, they're, and they're also talking about exceptions. We're going to just make exceptions for plans that meet that. Well, one exception is going to lead to another exception, et cetera. And next thing you know, Lafayette, downtown Lafayette, and that whole street in the, in the long term that's um, supposed to be a PDA is going to be... Um, high density housing, four, six story high density housing with retail space and below. These people think and they tell us that we are going, we, those people that are supposed to live in these communities are going to live there and work below or work somewhere in that neighborhood. How they know this, I have no idea. <sighs> you know, I mean, how do, what happens if you quit your job? What happens if you get a new job? I mean, this is what, what they're planning. They, they, it's crazy. Now, all of this, SB 375, links land use to transportation. These are the policy triggers that are going to be pulled in any direction they want in order to achieve whatever they want. And the jobs housing connection is the one that is their preferred scenario at this point. So this is what they're planning on doing now. And when this thing goes through, PDA focused upzoning. That means they're going to rezone all of those PDA areas. Upzoning means whatever it is now, it's going to go up to mixed multi use. So if it's a single family residential home, it's going to be rezoned to mixed multi use. And then you will be a non conformance. Now, if, as a property owner, I'm highly offended. As a property, as a, as a realtor, I'm highly offended that they're practicing this policy of using police powers which is what zoning is, to change something and not tell you. And this is what's already slated. There's strict boundaries. Remember I said the urban growth boundary. They created a, a strict growth boundary that forces the growth inside of those areas. Subsidies, everything's going to be subsidized. And OBAG, the, the, this is the uh, One Bay Area grant program. And then streamlining, that's a fancy term for saying waivers. As long as they have benefit corporations, as long as they have um, projects that they want done, they're going to give these people waivers, streamline the process. They're going to cut the red tape. They're not going to have to do environmental impact studies, and they're not going to have to do... So, so, you know, we have all these groups coming to these meetings, and they're claiming that, you know, we have to do this to save the planet and the environment, and it's for the greater good. Well then make them go through the same environmental impact, make them follow the um, qual Environmental Quality Act, don't give them any waivers. If this is supposed to be so environmentally better, then make them hold to the standard. Preferred road network and preferred transit, uh, as opposed to what? Well, committed road transit. You have committed funds. There are funds that the voters have voted for to uh, fix your roads and highways. And what this group, this regional body is doing is changing the definition of the word committed so that they can simply scrape that money away and divert it to high density housing next to mass transit because, of course, they're a transit authority as well. So, you know, I know um, Arinda has Measure L. Be very careful what you vote for because you vote yourself a, cent, a half cent tax or whatever it is supposedly um, to fix your roads and that money never gets spent the way it's supposed to. Why? Because they redefine the word committed or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that they do. So be very careful. Now at this point they're, they're talking about reduced parking. They're going to reduce the number of parking spots. They're going to, they want to increase um, parking rates. They were also talking in these meetings about a vehicle mile travel tax. They want to tax people 
10 cents per mile. I don't know about you, but I thought we already have that. It's called a gas tax, or gas taxes, right? So um, this is what they, they're doing. And this is a, a authority, a, a regional agency that has no taxing authority. Go on. Okay, so all of this supposedly is to save the planet, which is what AB 32, the Global Warming Act in 2006, was uh, passed for. And we were told that we needed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by, um, to, uh, 2020, to 1990 levels by 2020. Now, according to AP Reuters, as a, as a country, we're already there, but I guess they don't want to hear that. Um, but like I said, under the AB 32 um, bill, it called for the creation of a super council called CARB, the California Air Resource Board. And this is a completely rogue, out of control super council that can't even be audited by our legislators. Um, I went to a CARB meeting. I spent an hour and a half dri driving each way, three hours, waited in the meeting for four hours for a one minute opportunity to speak. And Mary Nichols, um, the chairman of the uh, CARB board didn't like what we had to say and shut the meeting down. So this is what we're, we have to look forward to, folks, because once they turn on the carbon credit trading auction in November, we are going to have a very difficult time in California as business owners um, and individuals um, affording uh, the regulations that are going to be put upon us. Now, the whole idea was to tax, uh, put a carbon tax on the big polluters, okay, the big corporations. We want to regulate them. We don't want them to pollute our air. So we want to create a carbon tax, and that was the whole idea, was to um, punish them. But what's happening now is they've already announced they're going to give 90% of those carbon credits away. Okay? And the rest of them, they're going to simply, you know, trade. So, I mean, the big polluters are going to continue to just simply either get free, free carbon credits, they're going to pay to play, but nothing's going to change. What's going to happen is you, the middle class, the people that are, are the hardworking um, Americans here in private companies and small companies that can't afford the pay to play are going to be the ones that are going to have to adhere to the carbon credit trading scheme and regulations and the environmental impacts um, studies and the things that all of these other benefit corporations um, will not have to do because they will all get waivers. Now there's also a plan at 2050 to reduce our carbon emissions to 80% below 1990 levels. 80% below 1990 levels. I called the California Air Resource Board and talked to one of the people and said, how did you calculate 1990 levels? And he said, well, we, it was kind of a guesstimate. In 1990, they didn't have any way of measuring this stuff. It was all, so they're guessing on this stuff. And I said, well, in 2050, we are supposed to be at 80% below. I mean, that's what, you know, our president has, has pledged to do. That's what our county, Contra Costa County, Board of Supervisors, I don't know if you know this, but I think in 2007, they voted to have Contra Costa County be at 80% below 1990 levels. And that is not part of AB 32. So whoever the Board of Supervisors you voted for, we need to work on them as well. Because it, in order to do that, and I said, can we even do this? He said, no, not without completely socially re-engineering our lives. And that's what's happening. In addition to this, this is all feeding into the global carbon tax. This is global carbon credit trading scheme. This is what they were talking about in Rio in June, is how to tax the American public how to reduce us to resources and, 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 and redistribute the wealth. And there's a global, car global carbon tax um, that they're headed for. Now, all this open space and wildlands, you know, we, I hear these city councils and counties and, and, and groups talk about, well, we need to preserve this open space. We need to preserve this ridgeline. Well, you don't own that ridgeline. You know, I hear these people at these ABAG meetings talking about open space as if they own it. And I have a real problem with that. You know, if you own property, if you've bought property, you've been paying property taxes, it's yours. You've had it for 30 years and it's your only thing that you have and you would someday want to build on it. Nobody ha should have the right to, to make that an open space and tell you you can't build on that as a private individual. Now, if this open space is government owned, have at it. Preserve it. But, you know, we ha I have a real problem with that. So, and the other thing is that they are not preserving this open space for the animals. They tell us it's all about the environment and the animals and all of this, but it's not. 
What they're creating, ladies and gentlemen, is these, they are creating land mitigation banks all over the state. Now the goal is to rewild 50% of the United States. Let that sink in. That was a conceptual idea that didn't get off the ground, but they're doing it anyway. In California, AB 2785, there I found through my research that the Department of Transportation, Caltrans, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife has a map in 2010, AB 2785, called for the California Central Habitat Connectivity Project. That map that he's showing, and, and go to the next slide, you'll see here, up here, shows you we are the first in the United States, in California, to have a wildlands map. The idea behind this, what they're telling us, is that we need to create wildlife corridors throughout California so that the wildlife can roam free. Okay, I guess. Um, they need underpasses and overpasses to get around freely. Okay. So, so this map, and I'm telling you, this is a government map. This is where you can find it on the Department of Fish and Game.ca.gov slash Habcon slash connectivity. The green areas are the areas that are already under the control of our government in some form or fashion, through BLM land, through, through parks and recreation, through whatever. The yellow and red areas that you see are the areas that are privately owned property that they will have to take in some way. And I'd say take because I'm not sure how they're going to take it, either through eminent domain, through conservation easements, through um, shrinking urban growth boundaries, through um, whatever method they plan on getting these, buying it. Um, but once they get those, then they will create these wildlife corridors. Now, there's also a legend up at the top right that says how much in terms of cost those areas will be for them to acquire. I find this extremely offensive that our government is targeting our private property across our state. I don't know about you, but nobody asked me about this. And you can look on this map and probably find your neighbor, your friend, somebody you know who owns property in that area. And this, to me, is outrageous. This is part of a 313-page document that calls for all planning organizations, all transit authorities, to use this map in their planning. So when they're talking about, you know, zoning, when they're talking about creating um, whatever they're doing, their plans, sustainable development, they're talking about using this map. So the high-density housing, they're creating these urban settlements everywhere. They're going to convert the suburbs into urban settlements, and the areas outside of those urban settlements will then be used to connect and create this wildlife corridor mapping system. Now, they say it's about the little animals roaming free. I say it's about money, control and money. I'll tell you what they're doing with this stuff is they're creating land mitigation banks like I said before. And when the carbon credit trading scheme goes live in November, these land mitigation banks are going to be used for carbon sequestration and this will become part of their carbon credit trading scheme and a trillion dollar piggy bank. So when you start talk, seeing those conservation um, areas all over the state now, you know, California's broke. And, you, and I'm driving around going, what the heck is going on? Where, why, where are we getting the money to buy all this land and conserve it and do all this stuff? Why are we doing this when our kids can't read? We're doing it because there's a plan in place, and the plan is to use this as a carbon, as a a trillion dollar piggy bank in the global carbon trading scheme that's going to start in California and go live. That's what's really happening. I went to these cardboard when they were talking about the windfall of money that they were going to get from this and how they were going to spend it. And how they're going to spend it is, a, is additionally creating more sustainable development, more high-speed rail, and more stuff that we're going to be forced to do in the name of the environment. None of this is about saving the planet. It's not. This is all about control and money. And the people that think this is about saving the planet are going to have a rude awakening. Because when you start, and you don't have to dig far, when you start scratching the surface, you will see that this is all a lie. This is an NGO called the Green Belt Alliance. And the Green Belt Alliance doesn't like any type of development anywhere. 
So I was always curious why Greenbelt Alliance would show up at these meetings and go, yeah, we need sustainable development. We need high density housing all over here, but nobody can build over here. I was wondering why they were all on board with this. They're all on board because they know about the map. They know about the carbon credit trading scheme. Michelle Peralt is on the board of Greenbelt Alliance. She was the sustainable, the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Remember I showed you that? That went to ABAG in 1997. She's on their board. And this is a, a map that they put out. I kid you not. This is on their website, the Greenbelt Alliance site, and it's called the at-risk map. At risk of what, you say? Of development. God forbid somebody actually develop their own property with their own private money. Now, I'm not saying that we should just develop everywhere, that we shouldn't have some type of plan. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that living in high-density housing is a bad thing. If somebody wants to live in high-density housing, there's plenty of places to do that. I'm a realtor. I'll help you find one. The point is, don't make the rest of us have to live this way. And don't make plans for us. We do not need regional unelected boards making our decisions. We will make our own decisions for ourselves. This is America. If you want to live in high density housing, go have at it. If you don't want to develop your property because you want to save the planet or whatever it is you want to do, that's great. But, um, but many of us move to this area because we want to get away from that lifestyle. We want to have a suburban lifestyle with our cars, our kids, our soccer, whatever it is. We want, actually, you know, sustainability. I would think that having a single family home with a yard and a garden, what's not sustainable about that? You got to ask yourself. Now, so stop using the word sustainable development and start using the word sustainable Liberty, and go talk to Amy Worth. <laughs> go talk to your city council people and tell them you want them out of Ickley, you want them out of ABAG, you don't want high density, low income Section 8 housing in your community, you're not going to subsidize it, and she needs to stop. This board needs to be abolished. We want local control because that's what this, once this goes through, there will be no more local control because they will take over and they already are. And you are not alone. Other cities and councils are fighting. They are, are fighting. You don't know about this because you're not at the meetings. I go to these meetings and it's, it's me and a bunch of stakeholders, you know, or a few of us objecting to this and they just laugh at us. So we need more, and we've chosen the La Mirinda group, the area, because it is a compact community. You all have a vested interest in each other's um, communities. And I think that if we can inform you and get you to do something about it, that maybe, perhaps, we can get the rest of the nine Bay Area counties to understand what's going on, because the people of the Bay Area do not know this is coming down. They're not being told, and the cities and counties are not fighting back, and they don't see the communities fighting back. So I implore you to fight back for your own future. Thank you.